Hello, and welcome to this lecture on the integumentary system. This is Dr. Stewart, and I'll be guiding you through this topic. Let's get going. The integumentary system, sometimes simply called the skin, functions as a two-way protective barrier between our internal environment and the outside world. It also plays an important role in temperature regulation, house of sensory receptors, and secretes important fluids. The primary organ of the integumentary system is the skin. Other integumentary structures include the hair, nails, sebaceous glands, and sweat glands. We'll discuss each of these organs in detail later on in the lesson. Before we discuss the anatomy and physiology of the integumentary system and its structures, let's look at the word parts used to create integumentary terms. This slide and the following slides list some integumentary combining terms. Albino, cautero, corporo, cryo, cutaneo, dermo, or dermato, which means skin. An example of a term using the form dermato is dermatosis, which means abnormal condition of the skin and diaphoro. Electro, erythro, hydro, ichthyo, kerato, leuco, which means white, and an example of a medical term using the combining form leuco is leucoderma, which means white skin. Lipo, milano, myco, Necro, onchio, which means nail. An example of a medical term using the combining forms onchio and myco is onchiomycosis, which means abnormal condition of nail fungus. Pediculo, photo, pio, ritido, sarco. Sclero, sebo, Systemo or systemo, trico, unguo, vesico, zero. Zero means dry. An example of a medical term using the combining form zero is xeroderma, meaning dry skin. There's only one new suffix for the integumentary system, and that is derma referring to skin condition. An example of a medical term using the suffix derma is scleroderma, which means hardening of the skin. We also have two new integumentary system prefixes, allo, referring to other or different from usual. An example of a medical term using the prefix allo is allograft, which is a skin graft taken from one person and given to another and xeno, meaning foreign. The primary organ of the integumentary system is the skin. Accessory organs are the sweat glands, sebaceous glands, nails, and hair. The skin is the largest organ in the body, and it weighs more than 20 pounds in the average adult. In addition to being the largest organ, it has one of the toughest jobs, providing the body with constant protection the skin is sometimes referred to as integument, or the cutaneous membrane. Think for a minute about a simple example. Suppose you step outside to leave for work or school, and you get some dirt on your hand. Your skin just saved your life. That little spot of dirt contains thousands of bacteria, fungi, parasites, allergens, and viruses. The soap you use to wash it off contains numerous chemicals. The water that you use does not have the same salts and nutrients as the inside of your body. Without your skin, all of those things would have gone directly into your body and caused damage. The primary function of the skin is protection. The skin forms a two-way barrier that keeps pathogens and harmful substances out of the body while keeping critical body fluids in the body. The skin also serves as protection for the internal organs. The skin also houses sensory receptors, sometimes called nerve receptors. The sensory receptors are located in the middle layer of skin, and they can detect temperature, pain, touch, 
in pressure. Messages relating to these sensations are passed from nerve endings within the skin to the brain and spinal cord. The sweat and sebaceous glands produce fluids that are important to the health of the body as well as the skin. Sweat glands help the body maintain its internal temperature. As sweat evaporates off the skin, it creates a cooling effect. The sebaceous glands are oil glands, and they produce an oil called sebum. Sebum lubricates the skin surface and keeps it from becoming too dry. The skin also plays an important role in regulating body temperature. In addition to sweat evaporation, body temperature can be lowered through dilation of the superficial blood vessels in the skin. When these vessels dilate, more blood is brought to the skin surface, allowing heat to be released. When the body needs to conserve heat, these same superficial blood vessels constrict. This keeps the warm blood away from the skin surface and prevents the escape of heat through the skin. In addition, the subcutaneous layer of the skin is a continuous fat layer and acts as insulation. The skin consists of two layers. Starting from the outer surface of the skin and moving inward, these layers are the epidermis and the dermis. Below the dermis lies a structure known as a subcutaneous layer. The epidermis is the thin outer membrane layer. It is the skin that you look at every day. The dermis is the middle, fibrous connective tissue layer. This layer houses the accessory structures of the integumentary system. The subcutaneous layer is the innermost layer of fatty tissue. It is sometimes called the hypodermis. While not technically one of the layers of the skin, it assists the skin in its functioning and will be discussed here. This figure shows the skin with its two layers the subcutaneous layer and the accessory organs. Here we have a photomicrograph depicting the three layers of the skin. The epidermis is composed of stratified squamous epithelium. This type of epithelial tissue is made of flat, scale-like cells arranged in overlapping layers known as strata. The epidermis does not have a blood supply or any connective tissue. This means the epidermis is dependent on the deepest layers of the skin for nourishment. The deepest layer within the epidermis is the basal layer. Within the basal layer, new cells are continually growing and multiplying, pushing old cells toward the surface. During this process, the cells that are being pushed upward shrink, die, and fill with a hard protein called keratin. Keratinized cells overlap one another, allowing the skin to act as a waterproof barrier. The basal layer also contains cells called melanocytes. Melanocytes produce a black pigment called melanin. This pigment gives the skin its color and protects the skin against damage from the sun's ultraviolet or UV rays. The damage from UV rays includes leather-like skin, wrinkles, and skin cancer. People with dark skin have more melanin and hence more protection from UV rays. The dermis is the deeper layer of the skin and is located between the epidermis and the subcutaneous layer. It is also known as the corium, which means true skin. The dermis is living tissue with a good blood supply. The dermis is made of connective tissue and collagen fibers. Collagen fibers are very strong fibrous proteins that act as flexible glue giving the dermis layer its flexible strength. Ridges formed in the dermis of our fingertips give each person a unique set of fingerprints. These ridges do not change during our lifetime, so they are a reliable way of identifying a person. In fact, fingerprints are still visible on Egyptian mummies. The dermis houses a number of structures. These include the hair follicles, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, blood vessels, lymph vessels, sensory receptors, nerve fibers, and muscle fibers. Below the skin lies the subcutaneous layer, or the hypodermis. This layer is made of flat cells called lipocytes. The functions of the subcutaneous layer include protecting the deeper body tissues and acting as insulation against heat and cold. 
Accessory organs of the skin are located within the dermis and include the hair, nails, sweat glands, and sebaceous glands. We'll take a closer look at these organs on this slide and the following slides. Let's start with the hair. The parts of the hair are the hair follicle, the hair root, the hair shaft, and the erector pili muscle. The formation of hair is similar to the growth process in the epidermal layer of the skin. The deeper cells in the hair root force older keratinized cells upward, forcing the hair shaft. The hair shaft grows toward the surface of the skin within the hair follicle. Melanin gives hair its color. Each hair has a slip of smooth muscle attached to it called the erector pili muscle. When this muscle contracts, the hair shaft stands up, causing goosebumps. This figure illustrates the structure of a hair and its associated sebaceous gland. Sebaceous glands release oil directly into the hair follicle. Nails are another type of accessory organ. The main part of the nail is a flat plate of keratin called the nail body. The nail body covers the ends of the digits. The nail body is connected to the underlying tissue by the nail bed. At the base of the nail, there's a white half moon area known as the lunula. Nails grow longer from the nail root, which is covered by a soft tissue called the cuticle. The free edge is the exposed edge that is trimmed when nails grow too long. This figure shows the external and internal structures of the nail. Sebaceous glands open into hair follicles and secrete their oil, called sebum, directly into the follicle rather than a duct. Sebum lubricates the hair and skin and prevents drying and cracking. Secretion from sebaceous glands increases during adolescence, which contributes to the development of acne. Sebum secretion decreases as we age which contributes to the formation of wrinkles and dry skin. Sweat glands, or sudorphorous glands, are found throughout the body. They are coiled glands found in the dermis. Sweat travels to the surface of the skin via a sweat duct. The surface opening of the sweat duct is a sweat pore. Sweat is sometimes called perspiration, and it cools the body as it evaporates. Sweat is normally colorless and odorless, even though it does contain a small amount of waste product. However, special sweat glands, called apocrine glands, are found in the underarm and pubic areas. They release a thicker sweat that can produce an odor when it comes into contact with the bacteria on the skin. This is what is known as body odor. Apocrine glands become active during puberty. There are a number of word parts used to build integumentary system terms. We will begin with some combining forms. Some of these were briefly discussed earlier in the presentation and others are new. Albino, angio, baso, bio, carcino, cautero, chemo, Ciso, corporo, cortico, cryo, cutaneo, cyto, dermo, dermato, diaphoro, electro, erythro, esthesio, hemo, hydro, Ichthyo, Kerato, Leuco, Lipo or Lipo, Milano, Myco, Necro, Onico, Pediculo, which means lice. An example of a medical term with the combining form Pediculo is Pediculosis meaning an abnormal condition of lice. Photo, pio, rightido, sarco. Sclero, sebo, septico, sistemo, 
Electrico, Unguo, Vesico, and Zero. Suffixes used in relation to the integumentary system are listed on this slide and the following slides. Al, derma, ectomy, emia, ia, iasis, ic, ism. Itis, logi, malacia, meaning abnormal softening. An example of an integumentary system medical term using the suffix malacia is anicchio malacia, meaning softening of the nails. Oma, opsi, osis, os, phagia. Plasti, rhea, tick, tome, and yule. Finally, we have a couple of slides of prefixes that are used in relation to the integumentary system. Allo, an, anti, auto, de, epi, x. Hyper means excessive. An example of a medical term using the prefix hyper is hyperhidrosis, which means abnormal condition of excessive sweat. Hypo, intra, para, sub, and xeno. This table lists some of the anatomical terms used when discussing the integumentary system. Note that these terms are adjective forms all of which include pertaining to in the meaning. Cutaneous, dermal, dermic, epidermal, hypodermic, intradermal, subcutaneous, and ungual. Congratulations, you've reached the end of this lecture. Be sure to watch any additional lectures on this topic and of course, you're able to return to this lecture anytime you may need a refresher. Until then, thanks for watching.